please join me in welcoming Anissa from New York City. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm very sad that I can't be there in person with you, but I'm glad that um, one of the many things we've learned in this uh, very odd period is that we can do things like this, where people can gather from, from all over and be together and share ideas. Um, so thank you so much to the folks at Ben Design for, for having me and inviting me to speak. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking a bit about what it looks like to um, essentially visualize justice, um, which I see as something very distinct from aestheticizing justice or trying to represent justice, um, but using beauty as a tool that can be used to maybe better understand um, what justice might mean and what justice might look like. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you all see this? I'm going to do this. OK, great. So yeah, telling stories, uh, visual stories through a lens of justice. Um, sorry. Uh, so throughout my presentation, I also want to give some context. So I often will speak um, in terms of people who are much smarter than me. Um, so I'll, I kind of use quotes uh, throughout it. Um, and so I want to just sort of give that context to as we progress forward. Um, so the first, I think, grounding idea, you know, we understand that justice is something that is often um, abstract. Uh, we think that we might know what it looks like, what it feels like, um, but I think ultimately justice is mysterious. Justice is a, is a practice of imagination um, because we're picturing uh, a world or a condition that maybe has never existed before. We're creating new conditions. Um, and I think in that sense, justice is a very spiritual thing. Um, and similarly, so is beauty. Attraction to beauty I see as a quality of the soul. It's essential um, for all people, not defining what beauty means, what it looks like, but just this, the need for being in beautiful spaces, um, cultivating beauty collectively, appreciating um, beautiful moments. Um, and I think that that relates uh, again to this notion of justice because there is a sense of um, egalitarian access, um, but also to the, the sort of individual nature of the stories that we hold dear to ourselves about what is beautiful. Um, and in that, in that variety, uh, we create a sense of justice. So um, there's a quote that I love from Toni Morrison, where she says, the concept of physical beauty as a virtue is one of the dumbest, most pernicious and destructive ideas of the Western world, and we should have nothing to do with it. And I love this quote so much because uh, Toni Morrison, author, icon, is a creator of beauty, a practitioner of beauty, an expert in beauty. Um, and yet even she says the concept of physical beauty is one of the dumbest and most pernicious and destructive ideas. And I think that the extreme language that she uses is so fascinating. Because when we consider beauty, oftentimes we understand it as something that is purely physical. We see it uh, as something that is more along the lines of pretty or aesthetic, um, as opposed to thinking about beauty in a deeper way. And of course, uh, Toni Morrison, if you're familiar with her work, surely cannot believe that beauty is only dumb and pernicious and destructive because she has created so much beauty in the world. But there's an important distinction to be made about how we understand even what beauty is before we dive into what justice is or what beauty can look like in a context of justice. So of course, uh, that is not the only thing Toni Morrison thinks about beauty. She has more thoughts and she says, I think of beauty as an absolute necessity. I don't think it's a privilege or an indulgence. It's not even a quest. I think it's almost like knowledge, which is to say, it's what we were born for. And here, there's this really important distinction made in my mind between physical beauty and a true beauty. Beauty is something that is, and a physical beauty, it's, it's merely surface. It's the, it's the material 
uh, reflection of something that is much deeper, whereas a true beauty is something that is really wrapped up in a core. Um, and we might not always be able to see it or understand it or point to it, similar to knowledge, but we certainly know, we know it when we experience it. Um, and when we think about beauty as a necessity, I think it also transforms our relationship to visual uh, media in general. So as a, as a curator at Four Freedoms, we're often thinking about how we create beauty in unexpected spaces. So one of the sort of flagship um, activations that we're known for are these billboard campaigns where we have, uh, over the course of the, the five years that Four Freedoms has existed, we've commissioned hundreds of artists to create billboard designs um, all over the country in all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, the US Virgin Islands. Um, and we use this as a way of co-opting political space, advertising space, spaces that are often telling you what to think, what to buy, who to trust, giving them to artists to ask questions or offer new ideas or picture something that maybe we wouldn't think to consider. Um, and in this process, as a collective, we're building new stories through a lens of beauty and also through a lens of justice. And I think the important thing here also is that while we are seeing something and there is a notion of physical beauty that exists, there is also a sense of beauty as knowledge, beauty as something that is connecting, something that is deeper, something that potentially reflects justice. So then what does beauty look like in a context of justice? What does that mean? Um, so here's another a quote that I love that can maybe shed some light. The best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me and, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes and not through the eyes of others and shalt know with thine own knowledge and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. This is, I think, very illuminating because we understand that we can see beauty. We can see it in a, in a work of art, we can hear it in a song, um, you know, but justice is not something that we always think of as being seen or experienced by the senses. But I really appreciate that this quote contextualizes it in that way. That is something you can, you can hear with your you know, own ears, see with your own eyes, express through uh, sensory capacities. And that it frames justice as something that is experienced similarly to how beauty is experienced. So, so then there, here it creates sort of this parallel um, in how we access these ideas. This is another uh, selection of some of the work that Four Freedoms has done over the years. Um, so as mentioned in the introduction, Four Freedoms is an artist-led organization um, that aims to model and engage with civic discourse through the arts, primarily through visual art. Um, and we work all over the country um, to create moments of what we call civic joy because civic participation sounds kind of drab and it sounds like something you don't wanna, you know, it's like a, a chore or something you don't wanna do, but civic joy is exciting, it's, it's collective, it's happy. Um, and that's what we wanna, that's what we wanna foster, we wanna foster um, that sort of spirit of togetherness um, through these sort of civic responsibilities and civic acts. Um, so a few things that I wanna point out across this spread of activities. Um, again, similar to the, the billboards, we have also used these lawn signs as a way of co-opting political space. Um, think, think about election times and how, you know, neighbors and businesses and, you know, all these different places are sticking signs in their windows and their yards to kind of put a physical stake in the ground of where they stand. Um, but often those kinds of signs don't leave a lot of room for the nuance of, of individual expression and belief. And so our solution was to create a series of lawn signs that where we leave the answer blank for whoever it is to fill that in. So this is a set that we've done uh, that reads freedom to, freedom for, and freedom from, where people can fill it out. So you can see on here, um, some of the contributions are freedom for happiness, freedom for everyone. Um, and 
you know, as we've done these lawn sign activations across the country, we, we constantly receive, um, you know, different answers and, and people interpret them in so many different ways. Similarly, right under that, this question, what do you believe in? This is, a, this is from a, an activity that we've hosted um, again and again, again, co-opting the language of political activity um, through town hall uh, events, as we call them. Um, and oftentimes in our town hall events, maybe we're asked, maybe we're bringing together artists or experts or whoever, but there's always some kind of a participatory uh, component to that. Because it's important that while we experience art um, as, as viewers and maybe sometimes in a more passive context, it also requires uh, active viewership and active participation to really realize those components of justice that we're often shut out from in an artistic experience, you know, think to going to a museum and kind of looking passively at works of art and feeling separate from them, where sure, you can look at something and appreciate it. Maybe there are a few works that you see yourself reflected in, um, but you're not often invited into the space, invited to um, sort of act alongside the artist as an artist yourself. And that's part of how we are trying to bring justice into this sort of artistic experience. Um, the billboard that's shown is a work by the artist Christi Christine Sun Kim, um, who herself is deaf and makes work about sound. Um, and visualizing the experience of sound as a deaf person, um, she uses, uh, you know, symbols and gestures that represent ASL often in her work. Um, and this is an example of a billboard that we did with her uh, in 2019 that reads enough. Um, and it reads it. As you can see, the word enough itself is backwards, and there are these hand uh, gestures that are written under it, um, which might seem odd, but the reality is that she is showing, demonstrating how to sign this word um, from the perspective of the um, signer, not of the person viewing it. So what you see here is inviting you to participate um, in the action yourself where she's acknowledging that maybe uh, it could be your, you almost become her eyes seeing her own hand signing the word, or it's an invitation to you to mimic the symbols where you can see uh, you know, the way that your hand is meant to move. And I think it's just a beautiful representation of um, the kind of art that is bringing you in to the process. Um, thinking about the relationship between beauty and knowledge, creating a beauty that is also contributing to um, our sort of collective knowledge base, whether that's our understanding of the deaf experience, our knowledge of how to sign a word, um, an invitation to put yourself in somebody else's sight line. Um, and by putting that up on a billboard, it reaches so many people who might not uh, elect to go see a work like that in an art space, in a museum or in a gallery. Um, so this summer, I was very fortunate to curate this series um, at a space called Pioneer Works in New York. Um, and Pioneer Works is, sort of, is a hybrid art space where they host um, artists, artists in residence. Um, they uh, do a lot around, around science and installation and sculpture and, and many, many wonderful things. Um, but it is definitely an art space and that has uh, kind of limitations and barriers that exist within that in terms of who is the audience that, that has access to this environment. Um, so over the summer, they had a sculpture up by the artist Kobe Kennedy, who we've worked with quite often at Four Freedoms. Um, and the work itself is called Khalif Browder, The Box, uh, memorializing and reflecting on the life of Khalif Browder, who at 17 was kidnapped by police for a crime he did not commit um, and suffered years of torture through solitary confinement on Rikers Island. Um, his story ends in tragedy. Two years after his release, he ended his life. But his story has been used by activists and organizers to rally around the end of solitary confinement and the importance of realizing the, the harm created by the systems that we have today that are meant to represent justice and often inflict the opposite of that to extremes. Um, I, uh, in conversation with, with Kobe, um, it was clear that we wanted to create a program series that 
faced in an honest and direct way the experiences highlighted by the story of Khalif Browder and highlighted by the work itself. But we also wanted it to reflect this notion of civic joy and beauty. But how do you create something that is addressing directly mass incarceration, but also contributing beauty into the world? And I think there is no group who can better answer that question than artists, because it's what artists do all the time. Artists are constantly engaging with the most difficult questions of our day in ways that are surprising and engaging. Um, and so that's what we decided to do. Uh, we decided to frame these conversations through the voices of artists. Um, I think it's also very important to note that this is something, you know, this is a, a serious and pressing topic. And um, while we were, you know, kind of brought in to create the series, um, it's also something that we, you know, in terms of the staff that were working on it, had very limited knowledge of. Um, we can read books and meet people and, and listen to their stories, but um, there's something that is, you know, of course, there's a, there's a very, very different knowledge base and level of experience that is created when you experience something firsthand. So for us also, it was very important that um, formerly incarcerated individuals were also at the forefront of the decision-making process. Because if we are telling a story, it's not necessarily our story to tell. Maybe we are the ones with the resources, we have the pen and the paper, um, but we might not be the best narrator. So in this process, it was a really beautiful um, consultative uh, journey and experience to work with so many artists who um, were so willing to share their story um, to share their art. Um, and I will, I will point out, so, so what you're seeing um, now is a shot from the, the second program that we had um, called Listening for Individual Stories. Um, on the left is Devon Simmons, our fantastic moderator throughout the series. Um, and then Pastor Isaac Scott and Roland Davis, both of whom are poets. Um, they performed work uh, that they had written, as well as work by um, a couple individuals who are currently incarcerated. Um, and the whole conversation focused on the, how do we tell stories? How do we, you know, use the correct language, use language that is accurate and honest, but also language that is compassionate um, and itself is oriented towards justice. And it was such a beautiful expression of what happens when you bring people in who are true artists are, are creative and passionate, but also really prioritize um, kind of expressing that, that sense of beauty through, through the eyes of justice. And this again was an example of, uh, you know, if, if we can express justice by seeing through our own eyes and learning through our own knowledge, I mean, this is, this is the way to do it. It's, it's to, uh, sometimes it's to step back and allow a story to come out from the most, um, you know, the most honest uh, narrator, not our own impressions or bias. Um, the third program that we had, we had a performance by this theater company called Truth Worker, which is made up of high school and college age youth who are all um, directly impacted by mass incarceration. Um, and Truth Worker is another amazing example of uh, visualizing justice in this really beautiful way because of how, as this photo demonstrates, they practice this act of passing the mic, um, that they literally lend their individual voices to this process, but they also as performers are so in involved and engaged in the writing process. Um, and I think it just shows, you know, in, in the kind of work that we do at Four Freedoms, it's, it's kind of unique because while we might be curating a project, we might be curating a series of, of artists to be involved in a billboard campaign, or we might be selecting a group of individuals to participate um, in a series like a program series like this. Um, oftentimes, we are, you know, giving, uh, giving the mic to the artists um, and doing it in a practice of trust um, in order to expand how we understand the way beauty is formed, the way justice is reflected, that beauty doesn't have to be something that is so controlled, um, but it can be something that sprouts out of uh, what we don't know, but others might know really well. So 
again, I think it's, you know, this notion of beauty uh, as something that is powerful um, and an agent of change does sometimes feel, even as I think about it, um, feel in conflict with each other and it feels flippant and it feels shallow. Um, but there is real value in beauty. There's real value in using beauty as a tool. And Bell Hook says, learning to see and appreciate the presence of beauty is an act of resistance in a culture of domination that recognizes the production of a pervasive feeling of lack, both material and spiritual, as a useful colonizing strategy. We need to theorize the meaning of beauty in our lives so that we can educate for critical consciousness. And this just so clearly lays out why we need beauty, why it is essential, that creating systems and structures that infuse beauty into um, and alongside processes of activism and organizing and change making creates this necessary break in the story that we're telling, that there are incredibly uh, difficult and serious components to the the things that we are trying to address or process or change. But when we bring beauty into it, it, it is a, a tool that helps us get to that point, get to that break of uh, doing away with the old structure that is incredibly uh, harsh and bringing something in that allows room for more. Um, there is a, one of the sort of isms that we'll say a lot in our, in our meetings together at Four Freedoms um, is something that the artist Carrie Mae Weems shared with us um, in January of 2020 um, during a, a meeting that we had with her where she said that there is a lot of room for seriousness in play, but there is not a lot of room for play in seriousness. And I think the sim it's a similar thing uh, with the sense of beauty as well. So when you create beauty, there is room for resistance and, um, you know, creating real transformational change. But when you don't prioritize beauty, when the whole concern is the seriousness, uh, you lose a lot of the, the, the lightness that you need, that you want in the, for the future that you're creating. Another example of some work uh, that we have going on at Four Freedoms is the, this Land Back Art campaign um, that will be put up on billboards next month across the country. This is a, a series that we're working on alongside um, a couple of indigenous led organizations to visualize the land back movement. And again, you know, the first, one of the first billboards that I showed had a question on it, um, but this is an instance where we are asking artists to answer a question. We've asked them, what does land back mean to you? And the framing of the question really is about understanding, of course, this is a very visual medium. We are looking for art that is visually beautiful. That's what we hope to receive. We're going to people who we know um, are, you know, are real artists and have this trained eye and have those sort of skills that artists have. Um, but by asking this sort of question that is oriented at the individual, what does it mean to you? Not just what does it mean? Um, it creates a sense of, of justice and storytelling that is a much broader thing that leaves a lot of room that accommodates um, different perspectives and different values. So it was beautiful to see uh, when we receive, as we've been receiving all these designs to compare the variety of how artists um, are understanding the answer to that question, even among a group of artists who are, uh, the vast majority of them are indigenous themselves. And then we have a few people who um, while they're not uh, indi part of indigenous communities, they are very uh, invested um, in justice for these communities. We've seen just the sheer variety of messages and visual languages that are being used. Um, whether it's the uh, Tlingit forms and line work in the middle or the, uh, the sort of tactile softness of clay, um, or the beauty of these sort of illustrated forms a lot in the context of magic and mystery and how special it is to see that when you ask artists a question, they will often give you an answer that you didn't know you needed. And that is what's so special about the kind of work that we're doing is that we are not approaching it with answers. We're often approaching it with questions. And sometimes when we, when we ask the question, we'll get more questions back. Um, and that only expands the conversation to include more, to include more people, to include 
our viewers, to include our audience, um, for art to be in conversation um, with other works of art. But it really is this special moment um, of realizing that when we are visualizing justice, it is not something that is prescriptive or singular, but it's in fact something that keeps on expanding in realizing that justice means something and beauty means something different to each individual in each context. Um, and as you add in more factors of the artist, the identity of the artist, where the work is gonna be viewed, how the work will be viewed, the scale that it's viewed, um, all of these components invite in new questions, new people, new components. Um, and that's really where the magic is made. So ultimately in this kind of work, it's about, I really see it as about storytelling. Um, we know that a picture is worth a thousand words, um, but clearly those words are trying to tell us something. Those words are sending a message. And it is the responsibility of curators to dissect what that message is so that we can responsibly um, convey that story to the people that we are inviting into experience um, the art that, that is being shared. Um, but the challenge is that uh, too often we are, we are given a single narrator and we are given a, a, a structure and a format that is, uh, that is obsolete um, and that doesn't work anymore. And so when we look at, uh, you know, the way art is often presented in these, you know, the, what is typically referred to as like a white cube space um, that is sterile and clean and rigid, it doesn't allow for room for the kind of uh, sort of flow and nuance that really represents um, a beauty that is oriented towards justice. And so we have a responsibility now to sort of break out of these formats and reconsider um, what are new formats that can sort of break through the barriers that we have been told exist, but don't really exist. Um, curator and director of the kitchen, Legacy Russell, describes this process as glitch. Um, and in her manifesto, Glitch Feminism, uh, orients this to uh, a digital, in a digital world where um, on the internet, um, whether we're looking at digital art or social media, um, or just sort of the, the wide accessibility of, of visual mediums, um, there is an opportunity for what she calls glitch uh, or a hiccup, a sigh, a shudder, a buffer, um, a moment of break. And like as he says, through the digital, we make new worlds and dare to modify our own. Embracing the glitch is therefore a participatory action that challenges the status quo. And what's so important about glitch is that it can be conscious or unconscious. It can be intentional or unintentional. But what it requires is participation. It requires us to step into that moment of glitch, to allow ourselves to maybe pause, maybe slow down to what we're used to, maybe reconsider the way we've been doing something. But it always allows us, it always uh, requires us to act um, and to embrace this process so that we can dream up new worlds and modify what we know. And this is when we are able to engage with Bell Hooks' idea um, of, of beauty as something that is uh, an act of resistance and works in that process. But in order to create something new, we need to create a break from the old. Um, I really believe that artists are part of that process and artists have the capacity to show us things we've never seen before. Um, maybe artists just present the beginning uh, or help us propel something forward, but they are definitely part of these processes. Um, and I'm really excited always to see um, how they do this and how we can share the value of beauty uh, in a world that needs a lot of justice. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, one, just would love for you to share how Four Freedoms got started. What was the, the vision behind Four Freedoms? Yeah, so Four Freedoms was founded in 2016 um, by Wallace Thomas, Eric Gottesman, Michelle Wu, and Wyatt Gallery um, as an experimentation. It wasn't, it was designed to kind of be an art project and be uh, an act of play. 
it began as a super PAC um, and it's changed, uh, you know, many times over. I almost feel like every year it becomes something new. Um, so in 2016, um, it, uh, some of the main kind of activations that we had, we did a billboard campaign that was, uh, you know, part of the early foundations of the organization. We hosted an exhibition um, and I think the, the vision of it was really about um, what happens when we invite artists into conversations that artists are often not involved in. Um, and then it was much more oriented uh, traditionally towards politics and political structures. And now um, kind of seeing how limited and damaging these political structures are, the conversation and the conversations we're inviting artists to have really expanded um, beyond what we think of as political discourse to uh, what we call civic discourse that we think kind of is a bit of a, you know, kind of bigger language um, to address the challenges that our society faces. Thank you. What has been the response and not only the response, positive, negative to the different installations, but also the impact? Yeah. Um, so one of the interesting things about kind of not telling people how to see works of art is that people will see them in very different ways. And we have definitely gotten responses of people who are kind of confused, but I think that, ex that confusion, confusion is exciting. The confusion is, is kind of a glitch that people are experiencing in their own minds where like they can't just move forward and you know, onto the next thing, but it, you have to kind of pause and like process what it is that you're seeing. Um, I would say generally the, the reception has been pretty positive. Um, because often we're inviting audience members to be artists themselves, um, I think people have the sense that there is room for them in this creative process, especially when we do um, these lawn sign uh, installations or uh, we do these sort of participatory, more activity-based things. Um, it's exciting to see how people um, really perk up at the opportunity to create for themselves. Um, the other amazing thing in terms of reception is that we are often having conversations through art that are not had so widely. Um, and those are maybe some of the most special uh, reflections that we get. So, um, you know, in the, through the Land Back uh, campaign, you know, we are, are giving a platform to many, many artists um, who who might not have access to such a large audience or to the resources that are required to put work up on a billboard. Um, and even creating opportunities where, you know, we have 20 something artists working together, it, all of these works really support each other that if, if there was one artist who said, okay, I wanna put my work up on a billboard, it's a very different um, scale and reception and power than saying, okay, we have this whole coalition of people who care so deeply about this and we're all gonna do it together and lift up this conversation as a collective. Um, the other kind of anecdote I'll share from, from the series at Pioneer Works, um, we, you know, the physical space itself is this old warehouse. It's, it's this very, very, very high ceiling. It's, very, it's beautiful. There's a whole wall of windows looking out into the garden area. Um, and after one of the talks, one of our, uh, our panelists who um, themselves as a policy expert um, came up to me and was uh, sharing the experience of talking about um, these very, very heavy subjects in a, such a beautiful space and how that was like a breath of fresh air for them where normally uh, these kinds of difficult conversations might happen in a conference room or some kind of an, like a drab office space, to, but to invite people into an art space, into a space that is physically beautiful, that is meant to deliver beauty um, was really uh, a, a distinct experience. And that also made me kind of appreciate um, a new dimension of, of how we can bring beauty into these processes that even, even the room that we host something in uh, really matters and can change the tone of a conversation. Talking about space, be outside of billboards or the sides of buildings, what are some other real estate uses you've placed the artwork and the messages? Yeah. So in terms of public space, I mean, we've done a lot on bus shelters. Um, we did a takeover of Times Square in, in 2020. Um, 
sending messages to essential workers. So screens across Times Square were, were covered in, in art from our artists, which is pretty amazing. Um, we've done postering campaigns, we pasting campaigns, um, you know, really just thinking about what are the what are the environments that we are already seeing media? What are the spaces that we're already being exposed to messages? Um, and thinking about what happens then when we when we use that space for art. We do, we have done sort of more typical um, art activations, so uh, like exhibitions and things like that. Um, we have a presence at a number of art fairs. Um, but then when we're we're in those kinds of environments, it's a it's a totally different thing. Instead of saying, okay, this is a public space or this is usually a space where we don't see art, let's put art there. When we're in those environments, we say, okay, this is an environment where we're used to seeing art. What happens when we ask a question or what happens when we bring in a conversation that normally would be shut out from that space? Um, so at, at Freeze New York um, in 2021, we, uh, installed two of our billboards in the space. Um, one work that asked, who asked you how to love? Um, and another work that said Black Lives Matter in, in English and Chinese. Um, thinking about how, you know, oftentimes those environments are, especially an art fair that the intention is to, you know, sell art. Uh, and it is essentially a, a commercial space um, to bring in notions of, of love and justice uh, it's kind of rare and exciting to to bring that um, sort of unexpected element into an environment that many in that in that industry are very used to. I see this weekend you're launching a new campaign in Los Angeles. What do your ancestors look like? Can mm -hmm. you share with us a bit about that campaign? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are we have created this uh, very robust and beautiful um, series in partnership with Converse called Hear Her Hear. And the intention of it is to bring, uh, bring the voices of, of Black women into the forefront um, and consider what happens when uh, Black femme artists are given the space and the recognition that they deserve. Um, so when we hear the voices, when we prioritize her and we give place um, and community to the kinds of creative practices that we are that we are engaged in. So this weekend we have our launch for it um, in an event called the Black Family Archive, hosted by the Black Image Center, which is an organization founded in 2020 by a group of young Black photographers to uh, provide resources and support for um, other young Black photographers throughout Los Angeles. Um, and the the Black Family Archive pop up um, is kind of what it what it sounds like. It is a space where they have, we've brought in a group of archivists from the Gates Collective um, to create and contribute to the Black Family Archive. So we've, we're inviting people to, to come in, bring their family photos, bring documents that they can scan and digitize. Um, and then, but they're also able to print photos from their phone um, because there is this really, there's something really important and beautiful about having a tangible object um, and having that printed photo um, and that's a project of just thinking about how, you know, again, in terms of storytelling, even our own personal stories, they don't begin and end with us, but they, they exist, you know, generate, they began generations before us and will continue generations after us. Um, and how much value there is in, in being able to see that and feel that and touch that um, and experience the sort of depth and breadth um, of, of our ancestry collectively. Um, but in this context, really prioritizing um, the legacy of, of the Black Visual Archive that has been that has been lost or um, underappreciated or under-resourced. Um, and our, our hope is to sort of collectively among all these different organizations that are coming together, um, led by Four Freedoms, to uh, sort of allow and sort of facilitate um, this process. I'd like to talk about your relationship with beauty. Isn't she beautiful? Um, have your own ideas about beauty or your relationship to beauty changed in the last few years? Mm. And if so, how? And how does that impact your work? Yeah, um, definitely, always. It's funny, I something about me, I, I have always been really drawn to aesthetics. Um, 
even, you know, I, I, you mentioned in the, in the introduction. So I did when I, beginning when I was in second grade, I collected pigs, not the animals, but like little figurines and dolls and things like that. Um, but I also, from a really young age, have been very particular about the clothing that I wear. Um, and it's a, it's a family joke that um, my, you know, my aunts and uncles used to taunt me. If I was, if I was being bad, they would threaten me with blue shorts and tell me that I would have to wear blue shorts if I didn't, if I didn't comply. Um, and it would, it would like really bother me the idea of, of having to do that because like things that I thought were beautiful felt really important, um, and always have. But I think the, the, uh, this sort of component of, of spirituality and mystery is something that came a little bit later, um, where I think when I was, when I was younger, I, loved art. I appreciated art and beautiful things, but I also felt this really strong pull towards justice, to learning about it, understanding it, applying it in my life. And I didn't, I didn't understand then how those, how these things fit together. Um, and it's really through uh, reading the words of people who are smarter than me and more experienced than me that I've been able to see the, how you do this. Um, so, you know, studying the words of, of people like James Baldwin or Grace Lee Boggs, who are um, both artists and activists um, and talk a lot about the importance of beauty in these sort of transformational processes that I have understood the my own role or my own relationship to using art for that bigger purpose. And in closing, if you can share any personal practices you would recommend to our audience about broadening or investigating one's mm -hmm. idea about their own beauty. Yeah. So I, I recently read, um, there is this, this text, it's a book that's pretty short. It's called The Secret of Divine Civilization. Um, and it was written as a, as a treatise to the Rajar dynasty of Persia in, in the 1800s. Um, and it talks about a lot about political structure, economic structure, educational structure. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a piece in it that talks about the attributes of perfection. Um, and in it, the author, uh, Abdul Baha, he talks about how the, the first attribute of perfection is the practice of justice, um, which I don't think we always know what that means, but again, that, that's what makes it a practice, not a not something that we sort of achieve and you know tick the box. The second attribute of, of perfection is the to be in a process of learning, constantly be in a process of learning. And the third attribute of perfection is to sincerely share what you have learned with others. Um, and I really see that as uh, when we think about beauty, it's often associated with a notion of perfection or something that we understand as being perfect. Um, and I, I think it's such a cool and special framing of what perfection means because it is uh, thwarting the notion that perfection is something that you, you reach and it's like an endpoint as opposed to something that you are constantly developing. And I also think it's really special because it frames perfection and kind of therefore beauty as something that we have to do in relation to one another. Justice exists in collectivity. Justice doesn't exist if we're sitting in a room by ourselves, never talking to anybody. Justice exists and is practice it, practiced as we engage, as we create community, um, as we contribute to a collective. And so does this process of learning and teaching. To learn, we have to be exposed to new ideas, be exposed to things outside of ourselves. To teach, we have to have somebody to teach. We have to have uh, people that we are in conversation with. Um, and so I think in this practice of, of understanding beauty for ourselves, it's really important to expose ourselves to new ideas and to realize that it is, it really is a practice. Um, and in order to be engaged in that, we have to allow ourselves to be in this, in a posture of learning, um, because that's when beauty can really, can really sprout and grow. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your beauty with us. And let's all give Anissa a round of applause. Thank you. And the last plant I, or seed I want to plant is we'd love to do a Four Freedoms Project in Bend. 
I'll be calling you. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Great. Josh. Do Josh. Do it. Do it. Do it. We'll be in Oregon, but um, would love to bring bring more art to Bend through Four Freedom. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.